In this video, I will show you how I removed my diff and get it ready for a rebuild. Hello YouTube and welcome back to another video. In this video, I will show you how I removed the diff in Little Fern. Firstly, I'm not an expert in any way or a mechanic. I'm just an enthusiast learning as I go. Maybe there is a better way of doing this, so please bear that in mind and read the comments section before doing this. I know if I had a video like this, then it definitely would have helped me before taking on this task. So please like this video if you found this helpful and make sure that you are subscribed. There will be a couple of videos about differentials. Spoiler alert, in a future video, I will take you with me to Rodham Race, where I get my diff rebuilt and also ask some questions. But more information about that later. Let's get the diff out. I guess the first question is, why am I removing the differential in the first place? Fern is a Sigma Supersport and came with a Titan LSD. I hadn't had Fern long and the diff wasn't working correctly. At that time, uh, money was a bit tight and the cheapest way to keep Fern on the road was to put a friend's open diff in my case. For the last two years, Fern has had an open diff, but I'm gonna change that. So I need to get the diff out and then get my LSD rebuilt and then put it back in. If you know a bit about differentials, Fern currently has an open diff. As you can see, I can turn each wheel independently. And then when I turn the prop, both of the wheels turn. Before jacking the car up, make sure that you have loosened the rear wheel nuts with the breaker bar, as we will be taking the wheels off. As you can see, I've already got fern on axle stands on their highest setting to give me the most space whilst removing the diff. I'm going to show you the steps that you need to take to get the diff out. First, the prop bolts. The prop connects the engine to the diff, and then the diff turns the drive shafts so your wheels can turn. You need to take the prop bolts out first because if you take the brake calipers off before doing this, then, well, it'll be a lot harder to do. First, turn the prop with your hand until you can see one of these bolts easily. To stop the prop moving, put on your handbrake on the highest setting or get someone to put their foot on the brake inside the car, or both. I used a ratchet and an extension uh, to get these bolts out. After getting one bolt out, you will have to take the handbrake off and then turn the prop a little bit to see the next bolt and then put the handbrake on again and just keep following that until you get all four bolts out. It would definitely be easier to have someone in the car to do this, but I did it on my own. But by doing it on your own, it just means you have a bit more moving to do because you have to keep going out and putting the handbrake on and off each time. These bolts have Loctite on them and I found these really hard to undo, partly because the prop was moving a little bit even with the handbrake in its highest setting and possibly because maybe I'm a bit of a weakling as well. <laughs> But anyway, there are four bolts to undo. I will be using a few of these magnetic trays to put the fixings in. It's good to keep them together and not lose them. I'll leave a link in the description below for these, but you can get them in many places. Right, on to the next task now. Next is to remove the wheels. I've already loosened the wheel nuts uh, with a breaker bar before jacking fern up, but I didn't film this part. This is very easy to do, and just make sure that you put the wheels out of the way. I'll just put them underneath the front of the car as I'm a bit limited for space um, in my single garage. Next is to unplug the cable for the speed sensor. The speed sensor is only on the driver's side on the rear wheel. There will be some cable ties that you need to clip off so then you can unplug the speed sensor. When we take the drive shafts out later, be careful with this side to make sure that you don't damage the speed sensor as I think it can be a bit delicate at times. Next is to take off the handbrake and remove the brake calipers. Here are the two bolts that you need to undo. I also loosen the handbrake cable a little bit to try and make this a bit easier. And there's also some cable ties that you need to clip to, which is holding the handbrake cable in place. There is a spacer or two spacers um, that will probably fall on the floor um, when you've taken the bolts out or when you're moving the caliper. I did struggle to get the calipers off. This was probably down to a few things. The rear brake pads are really old, as well as the brake discs. I'm guessing these are probably the original, so possibly 10 years old. I could have taken the rear brake pads out to make this a bit easier, but I knew that I was gonna be replacing them later anyway, so I wasn't that bothered if I damaged the discs or pads. I ended up using the handle of my breaker bar to lift the calipers off, but it wasn't easy. It definitely seemed an accomplishment when I got the calipers off. It's just one of those things. Sometimes things are a little bit harder than what you think they might be. 
I zip tie the calipers to the rear springs to keep them out of the way. Just be careful as the brake lines are solid and you don't want to damage them by moving them too far. Next, remove all of the rear anti-roll bar fixings. I also have the earth of my speed sensor on my anti-roll bar fixings, but this might not be the case for you. This is a very easy job to do. I'm not sure what the standard color of the rubbers are, but I have orange. What color do you have? Is there a better color to have? Let me know in the comment section below. Next, remove the drop link assembly, but only on the anti-roll bar. Take note of the current hole that it's in. I believe the setting that I have is standard on road cars, but you need two spanners to, of different sizes to get this off. Next, remove the four bolts holding the ears on. It was hard to show this on camera, but it was definitely easy to do. You might have to tug these a bit as there's normally a bit of silicon or something similar holding them on as well. Now carefully remove the drive shafts. These were heavier than I thought, so be careful when taking these out. I also put disposable gloves over the end of these just to try and stop any dirt getting in on the end. Also be extra careful on the driver's side to make sure that you don't crimp the wire of the speed sensor. You could take the speed sensor off before doing this, but I remember when I fitted mine, it was rather fiddly to get the right distance on the speed sensor. I've shown you how to do all of this on one side, so you can now do exactly the same on the other side or do both sides at the same time. It was definitely quicker doing the other side, but probably because I'd already done it once and I also wasn't filming, so two different reasons there. I probably could have got the anti-roll bar out earlier, but now the drive shafts are out of the way, there's a lot more space and it was a lot easier to get the anti-roll bar itself out. This anti-roll bar is looking a bit sorry for itself and could probably do with some TLC, possibly as other parts of Fern as well. The next job is to remove the A-frame and also take note of the washer placements on the A-frame. I did this on my whiteboard, as you can see here. There are three bolts that hold the A-frame on. The front two were very easy to do. The rear fixing in the middle, I was trying to find uh, two sockets, which I think were 17 millimeters, but I could only find one in my tool set. And after trying to think how I could do this without having another socket, I then realized I was being a bit stupid and that the socket that I used for the wheel nuts was also the same size, so a little tip for you there. Now to support the diff on the jack. I borrowed a friend's jig uh, to help for this. I zip tied it um, around my jack to hold it in place. It took a little while to get the jack in the right place, but it's definitely worth spending the time to get it into the right place. Now to remove the lower diff bolts, one on either side. I then managed to get a zip tie for safety around the diff and the wooden jig. Now remove the big diff bolt at the top. I used two spanners for this, but I probably should have used a socket as well. My spanner slipped off uh, the bolt, which wasn't ideal. I found this task a bit difficult because I really wanted to have my head where the jack was. This probably would have been easier with two people, so you could have one person either side, but it was definitely doable on your own. Now to lower the diff. When I first did this, it wouldn't lower. And then I realized that the prop was still connected as there's a little flange um, that goes into the diff. So then I raised the diff again to get the prop shaft out of the way. And I raised it a little bit by using a roll of duct tape. A word of warning here as well. Again, I did something else stupid. <laughs> when I raised the diff, somehow the bar of my jack came out. So make sure that you've secured this in place if you have the same jack as mine. This wasn't ideal as I had to raise the diff even more than to get the bar back in. Definitely a score by error and Hopefully you're not as silly as me. I know that I should do this every time and make sure that it's secured, but when I put my jack away, I have the bar disconnected. So it was just laziness really, but crisis avoided luckily, but it could have been a lot worse. Now the diff will come out easily. Just when you lower it down, you sometimes might have to lower it a little bit and then move the jack a little bit to make sure that it goes down okay. I was quite pleased with myself, to be honest, when I got the diff out. I'd seen a friend take it out for me before and I kind of passed tools to help, but this was the first time that I did it on my own. If I can do it, then you can do it. You can obviously pay a garage to do this for you as well, but obviously that will cost you some money. But I try and do as many jobs as I can myself, mainly to save a bit of money, but I also find jobs like this really interesting and also kind of the achievement at the end of it. But then saying that, jobs like this can be frustrating at times, but that's just working on cars though, right? Next is to drain the oil out of the diff. There isn't actually a drain hole, only a fill hole on the diff. I emptied the oil out of the drive shaft hole. I forgot how heavy the diff was, so this probably isn't the ideal way. Afterwards, I realized what I should have done is probably lied it on its side on a plastic tray that I use for oil changes. That definitely would have been a lot easier and would have saved my back anyway. I found a box and got it ready to transport the diff in. 
As you can see, I've taken safety into account here. I've used the uh, strongest color of duct tape, which is purple. And hopefully you understand the inside joke there. And if you do, let me know in the comment section below. I'm also using extremely safe white uh, zip ties as well. So yeah, it's gonna be very secure in place. What I did was I zip tied around the jig to hold the diff in place. I put a load of packing inside the box ready um, to take it to road and race. This was probably a bit overkill as I was taking it in the car, but probably a good thing to do if you are sending it in the post. And I was also a little bit worried about um, oil spilling out. I'd also got these plastic kind of covers, uh, which fit the diff perfectly. Um, but these were when I had the open diff put back in. Um, but I don't know, maybe you can buy these somewhere, I'm not sure. In a future video, I will take you with me to Road and Race, where I get my LSD rebuilt and put back into my diff casing. I also asked a lot of questions about diffs, and I'm sure you will learn at least one thing from that video. Probably many things, to be honest or I definitely did anyway. I really enjoyed the time at Road and Race and a big thank you to Ollie for spending the time with me. And yeah, keep an eye out for that video that will be released very soon. Hopefully this video helped you. Ratchet spanners really help with this job, as well as the magnetic trays. I mainly use sockets and spanners that you would get from a basic Halfords tool set. So there wasn't any kind of special tools that were needed. This winter, I've got lots of jobs to do on Little Fern. So if you have liked this video, keep an eye out for some more how-to videos that will be coming soon. Well, hopefully you've enjoyed this video and please like and subscribe if you haven't already it makes a big difference to a small channel like mine and don't forget every stone chip tells a story and i'll see you in the next one as you fade away